Now let's uh, welcome uh, Jack, uh, Joshua, and Christina, please. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Joshua Elliott from uh, the uh, University of Chicago Computation Center and the uh, Center for Robust Decision Making in Climate and Energy Policy. And um, I'm going to be talking to you about sort of um, how this, the uh, research at what we call RIDCEP, uh, the, the center at, at, at CI, has, has evol uh, is working across different scales in order to address food security issues in the context of climate and other global change factors across different scales. And really, my job is to try and bring things down from the global scale down to a little bit closer to the scale where Christina um, and, and, and Jack work, so that uh, to, to the bare element, and then they can scale their applications back up to the scale. So I'm going I'm to try to do that very quickly um, and, uh, and, and talk a little bit about um, what we do at uh, RIDCEP in context. I'm going to look at it this way. So um, uh, the RIDCEP Center works at, uh, across various different scales, uh, working from um, uh, things that are a uh, phenomenon that operate at global and multi-decadal timescales in the far future, such as, such as uh, climate change, um, all the way down to, to local and seasonal and sub-seasonal factors that, that affect um, specific growing regions and sometimes even specific uh, farm regions. And um, we, haven't come, we haven't come about that in, in a complete way, but instead, We've sort of made a transition over the nine years that the center has existed from doing this sort of global, um, um, far future work uh, down to these local work with the acknowledgement that sort of the, the extreme events and the crises that affect local environments, lo local populations, can teach us a lot about what the future climate is likely to be, what future food production is likely to be, and thus what the future of food security issues are likely to be. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, that transition and some of the work we've done at those different scales. Um, and then give you some examples of some of these issues. So when we started um, uh, the RIDCIP Center uh, in 2008, um, we were really focused on these questions of global GHG uh, mitigation. Uh, if you'll recall, uh, a new administration was entering the White House, and it was thought to be really only a matter of time before uh, national and or global climate policy was a reality. The question really was only how do we design that policy so that we can maximally reduce greenhouse gas um, emissions while minimizing the impacts to uh, the national and global economy and minimizing externalities such as, you know, such as uh, flows of, um, of pollutants or jobs or other things outside of our country in particular or, or more broadly. So we wrote lots of papers on, on this from a sort of policy and economic modeling perspective, built these big economic models to try and study these questions. We even published one paper in a um, in, an, in a law journal to try and get the international tax law people excited about border tax adjustments, which we thought would be a really, really crucial part of any national scale uh, climate policy. Um, mixed results, I don't know. Um, also in the process of doing that, um, we were keen to look at different clean, new clean energy, emerging new clean energy technologies and to try and figure out which clean energy technologies were at the sort of optimal points of their cost curve where they could really start to, in the relatively short term, um, contribute to clean energy solutions um, and thus to the decarbonization of uh, the energy sector and of society. And, and this is where we were first introduced um, to sort of agricultural issues um, by looking at biofuels technologies, especially around the Midwest, and the issues around biofuels, both positive and negative in terms of greenhouse gas mitigations, but also in terms of their effects on fuel and food markets and on uh, land use change and deforestation, both uh, home and abroad. And, um, uh, you know, mitigation is still really important, um, especially if we are to avoid the most devastating, devastating consequences of climate change. Um, we really need to focus on mitigation. And we at the RIDCIP Center do still spend a lot of our energy thinking about greenhouse gas mitigation efforts. But um, by 2010, if you'll recall, the sort of the climate in Washington changed just a little bit. And the prospect of, um, of a national and or global climate policy it seemed to dim. Um, so at the time, um, we decided that uh, it was important for us to think about the climate change that was likely to happen already and what, what we can and should do about it. Um, so we took a look at the path that the, that the world was on um, as of then. And in fact, 
as of roughly 2013, the uh, planet was really firmly on the, the global emissions of pathway that's considered to be the worst case scenario by the United Nations panel that keeps track of these things, the IPCC. Um, based on socio and political inertia and, and economic inertia, we concluded that it's very likely to stay close to this path, if not even worse than this path, um, through at least 2020. Now, the, the additional energy that gets trapped into the Earth's system whenever, uh, it, whenever the atmospheric greenhouse gas uh, concentrations increase, most of that energy ends up going into the ocean, and it ends up kind of rattling around in there for you know, sometimes as much as a few decades before it equilibrates with the atmosphere. And what that means is that even if we stabilized greenhouse gas concentrations now, it might be 30, maybe even 40 years before um, uh, land surface temperatures actually stopped increasing. So combined with these social, political, economic, and physical inertias you know, embedded in our system, we concluded that, we, can, we concluded that roughly 80% of the change, the climate change that we expect by 2050 is really already, basically already baked in to the global system. And um, concluding that, we thought, well, okay, we, we need to do something about the climate change that's already going to happen rather than just thinking about how we're going to mitigate into the, the climate change in the far future. So we started a new set of programs within RIDSEP looking at the impacts of climate change, largely in the, in the sort of 2050 timeframe, impacts to a variety of different sectors, but primarily focusing on global and regional food security. Um, and that's, that's what I wanna talk about for the, the rest of this talk. So um, we, um, in, in 2012, we joined a group of about 40 other different modeling groups um, from around the world to really do the first coherent evaluation of the impacts of climate change on a variety of different key primary production sectors, such as uh, hydrology, agriculture, et cetera. Um, our group led the agricultural um, uh, part of that analysis. And what we found was that uh, while there's certainly still a lot of uncertainty, there are, there are some interesting conclusions that can be drawn. Um, first, we found that between, um, on present day agricultural land, somewhere between eight and 40% of production of, uh, of the major sort of commodity crops like maize, soy, wheat, and rice is at jeopardy over the next, over the next century uh, of being lost. And as you can see from, from these plots, the primary areas of, um, um, that are likely to get hurt are primarily in those uh, low latitude regions where issues of food insecurity and, and in fact issues of rapid population growth are already, um, are already really quite dire. Um, we also found that in, like the far, in the far northern climate, there are likely to be new opportunities that can emerge that could be taken advantage of to try and ameliorate some of the consequences of climate change. Um, we, actually, we also worked with uh, an ensemble, a group of uh, global hydrological models to try and look at how the impacts of, of climate change and, in fact, of, of unsustainable water use were likely to lead to depleting freshwater resources over the, next, over the next century and what that would mean for food production. What we found um, is that in dozens of, of key river basins around, around, um, around the globe, and these are the ones in red or possibly these ones that turned gray, I'm not sure why. Um, um, these are likely to be constrained by freshwater availability, i.e. not enough freshwater available for the current levels of irrigation that are being demanded. And what, that, what, what we conclude is that somewhere between 20 and 60 million hectares of currently irrigated agricultural land in these regions is likely to have to convert um, into rain-fed agriculture by the end of the century. And, and this, is an, this means a loss of food production that's um, on the same order of magnitude or possibly even worse than the direct effects of climate change itself. And, and realizing this, we, can, we, we sort of concluded that, um, oh, there's a screen there. Realizing this, we concluded that, um, that we really need to think about climate change in, and global change, in fact, in a more holistic way. And I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by global change in a second. But the, the real realization is that Climate is not changing in a vacuum. Global change, yes, climate is a very important part of it, but global change means a lot more than just climate change. Um, global change is population growth. It's, it's wealth, and especially wealth redistribution. It's changing diets, and especially increasing demand uh, for meat and other animal products. 
It's increasingly erratic weather, especially in regions where farmers are, are pushing agriculture to more marginal areas where it hasn't traditionally been practiced. Uh, as I've already said, global change means depleting freshwater resources, uh, groundwater uh, wells running out, and even surface water um, sources uh, running dry from overusage or from increasing temperatures. And, and finally, global change also means deforestation, land use change, loss of biodiversity, and any number of other um, negative um, environmental externalities. But on the positive side, global change also means new technologies. And I've picked the most ridiculous version of that, new technologies, here to show, just because I figured, why not, if you're going to go, go all out, right? Um, new technologies that can improve, uh, improve agricultural productivity, and new technologies that can deliver us unprecedented levels of detailed data at the subfield scale, down to the, you know, down to the meter, down to even submeter scales, that can be used to, to optimize our inputs, to improve productivity, and very importantly, to reduce the environmental externalities of agriculture itself at the actual farm, field, and subfield scale. And of course, global change also means um, unleashing the adaptive capacity of farmers around the world um, to, to take advantage of some new opportunities or to change their practices in order to reduce the damages that they're going to suffer from climate. And that's something that this particularly brave uh, Canadian corn farmer knows quite a lot about. And all of these factors, many of these factors, are increasing, um, just like climate is increasing, at exponential or near exponential rates into regimes that are just far outside anything that we've ever experienced from any historical context. Um, and, and, and this is you know, um, something that we both need to be concerned about and something that we absolutely have to take into account whenever we're doing assessments of the future of food security, whether in the context of climate change or demand or population growth or anything else. So just quickly running through uh, a couple of these on the demand side. So population, as we know, is continuing to grow. It's expected between 2010 and 2050 to increase by another, an another roughly 50%. Um, almost all of that increase is going to be coming in the developing world. And at the same time, those pop that population is becoming more urbanized, and it's becoming significantly more wealthy. And what we know about urban, urban and wealthy populations is that as, as populations become more wealthy and more urbanized, they demand an um, increasing number of their, the fraction of their calories come from animal products. Um, and that puts an additional strain on the system. So as an example, here's the United, United States up here on the top, because you know, we're number one, of course. Um, but uh, as an example, let's take China, which um, at the time of this graph, which I don't know what that time is, was at about 5,000 US dollars per capita of wealth and consuming about 60 kilograms per year of uh, animal products uh, per person. If we extrapolate for this forward based on the standard sort of United Nations uh, intergovernmental panel, uh, climate change panel assumptions for, for the trajectories of GDP, China is likely to be, by 2050, is likely to be somewhere up here, somewhere in this circle. That is, a population consuming about as many, almost as many, perhaps even as much animal products per capita as the United States, but with four times as many people. Um, and depending on how you count it, uh, to produce one calorie, of, of, um, one calorie of animal products takes roughly 10 times more land, 10 times more water, uh, and, uh, and produces 10 times more greenhouse gas emissions than producing uh, the similar ca uh, calories in, in vegetable products. Um, and that led um, the UNFAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, a few years ago to conclude that food production needs to roughly double by 2050 to meet growing demand and reduce hunger. So that's a, a really huge challenge. Um, and um, maybe it's too aggressive, maybe it's too ambitious, but um, it's a really, really big challenge and one that we can't do basically on the supply side alone. So I've sort of hinted at the fact that the supply side picture might be dire, but with some potential solutions. The demand side picture might be dire, but with some you know, potential solutions. Um, and and, and what, that, what that means in general is 
um, in, a lot, in, in, in many places around the world that, that have issues with food insecurity is it means increasingly stressed um, systems, both in, in vulnerable populations that don't have access to global markets and so are, are, are extremely vulnerable to, to local extreme events like what we're seeing in Northeast Nigeria right now or in South Sudan or in many other places. Um, but it also means um, dire situations for populations who, who don't have enough domestic capacity to produce their own food and so re rely on import markets um, and therefore can see huge problems with food insecurity from price spikes caused by droughts or bad weather halfway around the world. Um, and this is a photo from you know, one of the bread riots in Tunisia and Egypt that are popularly associated with the, the, the revolutions that started the Arab Spring. Um, so these things matter. They matter a lot. Um, this led us in 2014 to join this group called the UK-US Task Force on Extreme Weather and Global Food System Resilience to really take a holistic view of what are the worst case scenarios that we can expect in the future, uh, in the present and in the future, are things getting better or worse based on assumptions of climate and other things and technology, and, and what is it that we can um, really expect and how can we create interventions and early solutions in order to try and ameliorate some of those problems that we expect. So we looked at the, the distribution of, of expected global food production over the, over the recent historical period, over the 20th century, and tried to estimate what is a, 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 what would we consider a very rare event in the 20th century. And something like a eight, eight, eight to 9% loss in total global caloric production. And then, in the, in, and then we did the same thing in the future period using our simulation models and estimated that um, that, that sort of one in 100 rare event gets significantly larger. And in fact, concluded that in the historical period, the kind of event we'd consider very rare, i.e. occurring only once every 100 years, could, could occur roughly once every 30 years by the middle of the century, and maybe even every decade by the end of the century without any efforts at, at, at mitigation or adaptation. So these are, these are extreme problems. This in turn led us to start thinking about how we can apply the technology, the modeling, the high performance computing, the data resources that we have at Argonne and the University of Chicago to try and ameliorate some of these events and the impacts of these events when they do occur. So research we're doing now looks at using um, high frequency, it's called high frequency crop monitoring and forecasting. So really leveraging every possible data source and modeling source and computational resource we have um, in, in order to really predict um, emerging droughts um, and, 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 and production deficits before they occur, or at least earlier, give earlier lead time to stakeholders and policymakers so that they can create interventions that will reduce the human impact of these events. Um, so for this, we're, we're looking at integrating satellite data and weather and seasonal forecasting and soil and management data into our high resolution models, which we run at big computers here at Argonne and at UChicago, to produce um, forecasts that, that actually track through the season at high frequency so that you can know as soon as possible when um, 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 an event is really going to cause a, a negative production deficit. With the ultimate goal of doing this at very high resolution, um, specifically uh, targeting as our, first, as our first attempt West Africa so that we can try to produce risk maps like this that, set, that, that tell you where, where are the biggest interventions necessary? Where are the biggest problems occurring? So that you can really target food aid, you can target um, interventions um, to help people uh, when they need it and not just after they need it. Okay, so um, I've given you a bit of a, um, a, a trip across scales from our early work uh, as doing a large scale climate policy and economic modeling and, and, and GHG mitigation all the way down to our present work um, trying to develop high resolution drought early warning and forecasting systems for specific regions in the world and in fact for specific subregions. Um, and you know of course what's next is to go to even higher resolution trying to apply our data and modeling and high performance computing to the field and subfield scale for precision agriculture applications um, all the way down to meter and submeter. And finally I'll just leave you with one thing which is Food is not just about economics and technology and environment, as I've sort of implied here today. Food is also 
a reflection of our social and our cultural values. The food that we eat reflects the things that we care about. It reflects um, our, our, how much we care about health. It reflects how much we care about each other. It reflects how much we care about our global society and waste and everything else. So food is a very, very, very complicated thing to study for this reason. And um, even with my, our attempts at doing these very integrated pictures, we still only managed to scratch the surface. Um, now, uh, Christina Negri is going to talk about, very appropriately, the very, very fi uh, high resolution uh, uh, part of this, um, thinking really holistically about agricultural systems at, at the fine scale, all the way down to, to soils, to biomass, to water management, and um, et cetera, the important stuff. So, Christina? All right. Thank you, Joshua, and uh, thank you all for, for being here. We don't need this, right? Oh, sorry. Yes. So um, thank you, Joshua, particularly for providing a very nice introduction to what I'm going to discuss. Um, we're going from his broad scale, large scale thing. We're getting more into um, what we do as consumers and as farmers, and, and that's level of... Um, of study, um, we are. Um, our work has started really trying to, with from a simple problem, which is really bioenergy and how we fit bioenergy into into agricultural systems. But you'll see that really what we propose is kind of a, a broader approach to um, to this kind of system level uh, nasty problem that um, Joshua has uh, discussed. And so I'll really talk more about agricultural system more in specific. So before I do that, I want to um, put there a definition of what we call ecosystem services. Ecosystem services is a fancier term uh, to describe really basically the benefits that people obtain from ecosystems. And ecosystems include also agri agricultural systems, agro-ecosystems as we call them. Um, and the stress I want to make is that not only from agriculture we get, and, and ecologic ecosystems we get, um, some actual goods like food, feed, fiber, biomedicals, uh, genetic resources and all that. We also attain what we call regulating services, like a forest will provide um, an impact, a positive impact on climate uh, or, or weather, um, will provide water purification services. There are important services that, that nature, uh, both the agricultural systems uh, and, and, and natural system in one way or another can provide. Um, ecosystem also provide cultural services. You know, we like uh, going on a hike on a national park. We have spiritual, religious values. If you think First Nations, you know, that's a lot of, of their culture. Um, recreation, ecotourism, aesthetics, and all that, sense of place, the, re re the relaxation we get from spending a day in nature. We also have supporting services, which are soil formation, nutrient cycling, all the basic functions that allow all the system to work together. Um, I won't dwell on this slide. I think we heard plenty from Joshua about the challenges of agriculture. Uh, I want to really talk to you about a few things. The first one that involves us as, as consumers and, and users is really how just bad for the environment are our options. And I just quoted this because it's a very recent paper that came out um, and, uh, and really puts on a, on a map you know, the various agricultural products and, and the qualifies their impacts on several different markers of environmental outcomes. Greenhouse gas emissions, land use, which is really how much land we, we're taking up out doing a certain type of agriculture, energy use, um, acid, acidification potential, and eutrophication, or basically the way, uh, eutrophication potential, which is really potential for impacting water quality. As you can see, uh, in green, we have truly agricultural products, food that we eat from plants themselves. As we go down the list and we start getting into meat products, in addition to the fact that they're going to be growing in consumption, as Joshua mentioned to you before, is also that their impact on various environmental metrics is, is, is basically eventually an order of magnitude higher, particularly ruminant meats, beef, is really going to be a, a lot more impactful in environment than um, anything else on this map. And so this is kind of a puzzling thing. We want to feed more people, have more uh, protein, animal protein in particular for the people, yet we have uh, much higher environmental impacts. 
uh, on all of these. And then so we say, well, yeah, let's go for organic and, uh, and see maybe that is better. And obviously organic is a lot better for us, right? We have micronutrients, and more ac micronutrients, antioxidants. We have less pesticides in our food. We have more biodiversity and, and soil, and carbon and soil. But if you look at the environmental impact, there's really kind of a mixed bag of, of, of effects. You can see that on one side, greenhouse gas emissions, which are tied to energy use, tend to be lower in organic food, uh, yet uh, the potential for water impacts is higher. This is manure on, on one of uh, consequences. Uh, and land use goes up, right? So we're using more land because we are less productive. So, it really depends on what we want to do. And then we think, well, maybe greenhouse, you know, produce, produce grown in, in greenhouses versus produce grown in the open field. What is the balance there? And we see that, yes, we have lesser land use and lesser um, water pollution, but at the same time, we increase our energy use and therefore we increase our greenhouse gases. So it's a mixed bag, really. It really depends on what our priorities are. And, and we need to account for all these different things in trying to come up with a system that really uh, meets our real uh, overall needs. Uh, and the problems don't start here. Um, uh, we are trying to do a lot with a system that eventually is not very efficient. 38% um, of the world's land area is already in farmland. Uh, we can um, predict, uh, this is World Wildlife Fund, predicts that more and more land is going to be developed to meet this you know, food requirement of growing population by 2050. Um, here in the United States, we use, this is an example, 9 million acres are, acres are planted in corn uh, yearly in the United States. And if you see where the, the corn goes, it's very little that goes actually to food. The majority goes to ethanol in one case, and the vast majority over historically is really going to um, feed and residual use, meaning it goes to feed animals, right? And it goes to feed, in this particular case, pork, poultry, dairy, and beef. And what gra this graph tells you is the efficiency of conversion um, into meat of that corn feed. And what this tells you is that we have a very inefficient system. For um, all that we put provide as corn, only 9% uh, of it goes into making pork meat. 13% uh, down to 3% of beef, and that's why it's also so environmentally negative. You really have an efficiency which is very minimal. The rest is all losses. So we are trying to do more with a system that is actually very stacked against this productivity. So obviously, we need to think through and, and think um, a lot about how we address the system and, and how we can improve the efficiency here. We make decisions about what we want to eat eventually also, and, and really how to to fix the whole problem. And, and what we really have is a, is a system level problem, right? Because every time you touch a little aspect, you balance off the rest. And so you really need to find a, a way to keep all these things um, in common uh, and going uh, kind of well together. And so what we think is really that when we think about using resources, whether it's land or water or whatever it is, we really need to take um, an approach in which we really try to get more resources from from this, from more, more impacts, more positive impacts from the same resource. Going back to that ecosystem services um, table and, and definition, that means that we not only we want agricultural production, but we also have some conservation. We want to make water cleaner. We want to do all that. We want to have more uses than just food, and we want to stimulate the rural economics and development, we want to have biodiversity, all the good things we care about. So how do we do that, particularly with the fact that we really want to keep all this um, circle of sustainability uh, really um, whole, right? We want to have economic, ecology, culture, and politics all fulfilled as much as we can with this complicated system. So uh, if, we, if we think about that, really, we can do a lot of different things. We can improve crop yields and, and do some modifications and, and selection of the best crops that are the best and, and keep growing more and more. We've done that. Corn has grown in, in yields tremendously over the last uh, decades. And so we've done that. Um, and so I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk really about how we use the, our land resources in this particular case. And so this is a picture of the Midewin uh, Tall Grass Prairie Restoration Project near Juliet. So this is what the Midwest or Illinois looked um, way back then before uh, we came in and, and started uh, farming it. 
uh, with, the, um, with the advent of um, fertilizers, uh, chemical fertilizers, we came up to a land use, what you see here, land use, and, and basically yellow and green stands for um, uh, corn and soybeans, and, and it's really pretty binary landscape, right? Either it's corn or soybean, next year it'll be reverse. Uh, but it will be like that. Um, this is a very simple landscape and really is developed by economic pressures to basically produce one thing, produce yields, produce productivity, uh, farm profit, if you will, which is not a wrong thing, everybody needs to live, right? But it's really designed with that thing in mind only, pretty much. What we really are trying to, to develop, and we should develop, is something that looks like this. And this is really the USDA, the National Re Natural Resources Conservation Service. And when you think of a different landscape, you think of a lot of different functions in the landscape, and, and you think about how, how all these things can come together. So certain crops here can filter water before it goes to the creek. Other things stop erosion. Um, a lot of more complicated functions, which can actually bring not only the yields and, the, and that provisioning services, but also the regulating services, water quality, biodiversity, and all that. So I'm probably the only person that goes to, uh, to uh, Urbana Champagne from him here and looks at all these different features in the land, uh, landscape. I'd encourage you to look for all these things because they're a good sign, right? Uh, we are doing the right thing if we do that. So multi-functional -land landscape have old roots. This is a favorite thing of mine because it comes back from my own country. This is actually a, uh, a writing from Leonardo da Vinci. He's in the Code Leicester. Um, and he discusses way to organize the land so that, uh, that water can flow from one field to the next in the most efficient way possible. Why, what does it do with, and what does it have to do with, with multifunctional landscape? This is a cultivation uh, system um, that's very ancient, was developed by the Benedictine monks back in the 1300s. And it was using wastewater, waste water from, from the city of Milan was conveying it on these fields, and, it was, and the water was flowing on both sides of this. And it did two things. A, it recycled all the nutrients in the wastewater, or the, basically the sewer water. And B, that protective layer of water created a thermal insulation layer so they could actually get water even in winter. Um, sorry, could get grass even in winter growing. You can see the snow melting away where the rest is all white because of the water flowing in there. That's an example that we have, and we had a really good engineer for that. Uh, back to the uh, Renaissance man, man over there. So from those times, what has changed in agriculture in the last few decades or so? As, as Joshua mentioned, precision agriculture is really the thing, right? And so not only they, you, can, you can do large modeling and large work, uh, work at large scale with precision ag, but you can also impact the field. This is our field site in Fairbury, Illinois, which is about an hour and a half from here. And what you see here is a tractor with a, um, a mounted piece of sensor equipment here that actually come, comes up with maps. This is a map of cationic exchange capacity, a measure of the ability of soil to retain uh, nutrients. This is a map of pH, and this is a map of, map of organic matter. matter. This is a yield map. Every single uh, line you see is a run of the combined conducting um, corn um, yields. Uh, courtesy of my, my colleague uh, Yuki, this is a, a remote sensing machine, drones and all that really can help us give a tremendously uh, accurate picture of what we want to do and go at the subfield level. And so if you want to think at smart landscape, this is what we think about, sustainable land use intensification at the farm level. We take marginal land, land that's not so good at growing regular crops. We think about recycling of those nutrients that are lost by corn and other crops. And we design a system that is a combined system where we have multiple crops going in there. And the efficiency of nitrogen utilization goes high and we decrease the amount of um, pollution in the water. And so that's what we are working on. And what we found through our work is really that many times the economic losses and environmental concerns go together. This is a precision map uh, from this field that we converted into profit. Basically, based on the yield in every little cell of these, we calculate the profit. Do you see areas where the farmers lose a lot and, farmers, uh, and the farmer gains a lot? And so not all parts of the field are created equal, but what is striking is the areas where the farmer lose a lot of loses a lot of money is also the area where we lose a lot of fertilizer, and it goes down six feet, seven feet below ground where the corn cannot reach it. So, so there is something to say there that if we fix this, we also fix the economics in the field, right? And if we find something different here, we can fix this. So what we are thinking in an area like this, you can see nothing really grows well and the fertilizer all goes down. 
so working landscape as Mark, this is our field site. These are willow crops growing together with corn. And ultimately, what we can do is convert what this nasty picture was at the beginning into something that's improving with time. And ultimately, we'll get to constantly having this kind of pattern where we don't have uh, contaminants uh, in the bottom of the, of the field. So I'm almost done with this. I wanted to say that this can also do, be done at the higher scales. And that's, again, approaching a little bit what, what Joshua is doing. But a, a, a watershed, our field site is, is right here, where you go from a binary production of corn and soybean to a more complicated um, and varied landscape. Uh, you see the red in where we have additional perennial crops. You can actually go in re decreasing nitrate a lot. The, the more intense the color, the more there is. So you decrease that. We decrease sediment, which really impairs our waters um, tremendously. We, you see here the change. And as an ancillary benefit, what we do is improve the pollinator nesting index of all this, this whole um, watershed. We go from a very poor system in which only the creek beds basically have some pollinator habitat into a much more varied uh, environment, which protects uh, a tremendous ecosystem service. Last but not least, um, if we look at the economics of this and we compared the value of the crop itself, in this case, is switchgrass, but it's, it's still a perennial grass. It's native to Illinois. And we look at how much it costs. We find that the value of the water quality services provided is almost three times, pretty much three times as much as the value that we're losing. So what we're arguing for this is really that if we start accounting for all these values in a, in a, in a good way, maybe we have a way to actually get both yields and, and the production that we want and some benefit that enables all this environmental protection that we so want. And we haven't even started talking about biodiversity, wildlife protection, recreation of other kinds. So um, there's a lot to be said about that. So I will just conclude. I think I'm almost out of time. And, and our take on all this is really that a broader view and a systems approach is really what is needed to address all these multiple needs. And only if we put ourselves away from stovepipes and thinking each system differently, we can actually find a solution that can address all these big issues. Um, eventually, sustainable agriculture will require a putting a dollar value in front of all, the, all these ecosystem services, not just producing a crop, but producing water quality, producing carbon in soil, producing biodiversity, pollinator, and all that. Um, and it will be an important scientific uh, and technical and, and policy uh, discussion to, to have. And, and for all of us, it really will take careful adjustments to diet, recommended diets, advances in productivity, all the, all the new biology improvements that we are finding, and science-guided innovation to ensure that all our children, all of them across the world, will have food to eat and a clean environment in which to thrive. And so with that, I'm just closing saying that we can all make a difference through our choices and awareness um, and it's really important that we, we, we all share um, potential solutions to this problem. And that is all I had. <laughs> I actually had another slide in which I wanted to really thank all the people who have put tremendous hours of work. Many of them are here in the room, Jules, Herbert, Patty, Colleen. They are carrying on all this incredible work in the field, collecting all this data. Uh, we also have many students here. Some of them are where, uh, next to our posters there. I hope you had a chance to talk to them. Every summer they come here, and while they learn, they really help us do a lot of work, and a lot of other people who have helped us work um, on this project. Thank you. Thank you. So now I will introduce the next speaker, who is Jack Gilbert. It's a, a big pleasure to me to, to introduce him. Uh, Jack uh, is my colleague. We have uh, a lot of work together, but that will be for another time. Uh, he is a microbial ecologist. He's the leader of the microbial ecology group here at Argonne. He is also a professor of surgery uh, at the University of Chicago. And you'll see from his presentation what that has to do with microbial ecology. Um, he is also the co-director of the Microbiome Center with the, between the University of Chicago, the uh, Marine Biological Lab, and Argonne. And um, above, all, above all, he is a great communicator, and he is the author of many publications and uh, recently a book, as you heard from Paul Kearns. And so uh, wonderful. He got his PhD, as Paul was saying, from the UK, and he has been with us for a number of years now, and it's great to have him here. Ooh. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you very much. I assume we'll just go straight forward. There we are. So, um, yeah, how does a, an ecologist end up being a professor of surgery? You have to ask that question. Uh, I think I'm the only professor of surgery who is an ecologist in the world. Uh, but then uh, you, never, you never want to stop. I actually started my life in butterflies, right? I love butterflies. They're uh, brilliant. Uh, I used to spend my time hanging out in Africa collecting butterflies and in my late teens and early 20s, and that's what I thought I wanted to do with the rest of my world. But then I, I focused my attention very early on onto smaller bugs, uh, bacteria, right? And I looked in oceans and lakes and rivers and soils and plants and all over the planet looking for... I guess, what makes them tick? You know, what makes a microbial ecosystem work? Why do bacteria, fungi, and viruses all communicate with each other to produce an outcome which is valuable for an ecosystem, right? And it, so when I came over here in, uh, I guess, 2010 now, so it must be seven years, yeah, it's quite a long time. Yeah. And uh, I, um, I, I was very, very keen to explore other opportunities to expand that understanding of ecosystem science into new realms of, of scientific investigation. And one of the key areas, right, was crop productivity, uh, making sure we have enough food on the planet, and then the human body. I, what happens to you after you actually eat that food? Um, and so the microbiome as it stands, the, the community, the ecosystem, the forest of bacteria, fungi, viruses that live inside your body, it shapes how the food you eat shapes you. Right? You are what you eat, right? Well, you are what you eat only at the say-so of your microbes. Your microbes play an extremely important role in determining how you're going to respond to the food. And so, if we're going to go from the satellites down to the rivers down to our uh, bodies, we have to go even smaller than that, and we have to look at the microscopic organisms that live inside us. And there are, uh, I think Paul pointed this out, there are actually 40 trillion microbial cells in every single one of you. About two to three pounds of your body is bacteria, right? Um, it's about 2%, maybe, some of you. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a chunk of weight, right? That's a bag of sugar and a half. That's, that's a lot of bacteria. Most of them live inside your intestine. They actually have around, oh, I don't know, about uh, 7 million genes. The human being has 25,000 genes. That's 25,000 little bits of genetic information that tell your body how to make you. But there are 7 million microbial genes living inside your body as well that tell those microbes how to make each other, right? And that, and how we can leverage that, is my new job, I guess. I guess I've got to figure out what I've got to do. This is what I'll do, right? So where do we get it from? We get it mostly from our mothers. Um, so all the mothers out there, thank you. That was a nice birthday present, literally. Um, <laughs> This is a, a PCOA plot, right? So each dot is a microbial ecosystem. Think of it as an Amazon rainforest. And the, the dots that are closer together are more similar. So up here we have mother's oral cavity, the, the, a swab of bacteria from inside the mouth, right? So it's basically saliva. So you think of that as a rainforest. Down here we have mother's uh, vaginal cavity that has bacteria that are co-associated with the birth canal. And over here we have mother's uh, skin. So bacteria that are co-associated with the skin. And you can see already that mouth is different from vagina, which is different from skin. That's good, right? <laughs> You're like, yeah, that's good. <laughs> All right, sometimes it's not, just saying. Um, in this instance, we're actually interested in the babies. These are mothers giving birth. And the babies born via C-section pick up an interesting difference compared to the, the babies born via the birth canal. Birth canal babies pick up vaginal microbes, which shape their immune system in the very earliest phases of their life. Babies born via C-section get skin microbes, bacteria from the skin of the mother or the first person they physically interact with. That shapes their immune system differently. Different microbes shape how your immune system develops in a different way. And this can have lifelong repercussions, um, some of which I'll talk about today. But most importantly, we want to know what happens when you interrupt that process. So when you take vaginal microbes and swab them onto a C-section baby. And this is actually research that's ongoing. We call it vaginal seeding, right? We actually take the microbes from the mother and we swab them all over the child. Sounds gross. It's actually exactly what they would have experienced the normal way. We're just, uh, you know, manufacturing it. Potentially it could have a role. You know, who knows? What's interesting is 
That exposure early on in life, and then every decision you make afterwards, makes you have a microbially unique environment, right? So every single one of you has a unique complement of species. Every single one of you. I can actually tell you apart based on your microbiome. And it's not like I'm building something with the FBI to actually track you in that way. I wouldn't allow to tell you if I was, but um, Paul knows, so you can ask him. Um, but even identical twins have a unique microbiome, the same genetic information in their genome, but their microbiome is different, so we could track them and identify them differently. But this means also that how you respond to the diet you eat is affected by that unique microbiome. And in fact, what we've shown is that how you, the glycemic index of your food, and this is like how much sugar you get inside your blood and how your body responds to it, right, can be affected by the bacteria inside you. So that um, I might be able to eat uh, a cup of white rice and, uh, and I don't really have a blood sugar spike from it, but if I eat ice cream, man, my blood sugar goes off the charts, right? Whereas you, sir, you might uh, eat white rice and your blood sugar goes off the charts, but you could chow away on ice cream all day and your body takes care of it. And what we found is it's the bacteria living inside your gut that make that decision for you. They actually shape how your body produces insulin. They shape the food before it even gets close to your bloodstream. And so there's actually a company started up to take advantage of this. And they, they profile your microbiome and they profile the types of food you eat. And they give you an ideal diet to actually keep your blood sugar levels normal. That alone could have a profound effect upon diseases such as diabetes. But also upon many other facets of your body. So I'm going to give you some examples. Right, number one, microbes can change the way we smell, right? So bacteria on our skin produce chemicals which are sensed by mosquitoes, and those chemicals attract mosquitoes to different parts of our body. So some mosquitoes like to bite your wrist, others like to bite your ankle. Now, what you eat changes the chemicals which you sweat out, right? Which changes what the bacteria have to work with, which changes how you smell. So the types of food you eat can actually shape whether you are uh, attractive or not attractive to mosquitoes. Mosquitoes find you based on how much carbon dioxide you pump out, right, when you're breathing. But they hone in on you, and then they get confused. Most of the chemicals, repellents that we use, are just designed to confuse a, a mosquito into not biting in the right place. So we actually try and interpret that and figure out a better way to strategically identify it. We know that microbes can affect um, how, you are, how responsive you are to drugs as well. And this is important, Tylenol. For example, everyone here has probably taken Tylenol at some point. Some of you in this room will have bacteria that if you routinely took Tylenol every day, those bacteria would turn the Tylenol into something that actually increases liver toxicity and makes, uh, makes the Tylenol actually dangerous to consume. So we're profiling people now more routinely when we diagnose that. That is a picture of two flies. Yeah, exactly, right? Um, <laughs> We know that we can change animal behavior by altering the bacteria inside the animal. This is, could be extremely important, right? I can, I can change uh, the mate preference of a fly. So if I take the microbiome from one fruit fly and I transplant it into another fruit fly, that second fruit fly now fancies the fly that the first fruit fly fancied. Try saying that ever. <laughs> but it works. So we think that by putting the microbiome into your medical records, we could have an impact upon disease. And why? Well, our lifestyles have been changing recently. We used to play outside all the time. Now we spend the majority of our time indoors, 90% of our lives, and we use a lot of cleaning products that basically kill all known microbes dead, good and bad, right? And we're trying to figure out what that does. It looks like it decreases our microbial exposure. That shapes our immune system and potentially leaves us open to atopic diseases such as asthma and allergies. We think that by adding bacteria back into the experience of children especially, we could have a profound effect on reducing whether they suffer from those conditions. And a lot of that effect has to do with what they eat, because the microbes are feeding off of your food. And what you eat shapes who can live inside you. So a kid that's eating a lot of sugar and high fat is going to have a very different microbiome from a kid who's eating a lot of, I know this never happens, but lettuce and tomatoes. <laughs> I, I still can't get my kids to do it, but it, you know, if they did, they'd be healthy. That's what I tell them every morning over their cereal. We know that this kind of effect 
is destroying the ecosystem inside our bodies. And we want to turn that around and do something better to make sure that the forest inside us is healthy and robust and can stand mild fluctuations. So if you do want to eat a hamburger once a week, that's fine. Your body's not going to overreact to it. We know that the microbiome also alters the susceptibility to many types of diseases. So disruptions in the bacterial community in your body could potentially be trigger factors for everything from cancer all the way through to Parkinson's and even chronic pulmonary diseases. We know that um, asthma is obviously related to it, but also psoriasis. PTSD, anxiety, and potentially even autism could be linked to disruptions in the microbiome. It's not like the microbiome causes everything but it's part of the ecosystem inside your body. And when you disrupt one part of that ecosystem, it affects everything. For example, obesity. We know that when you eat too much, you put on weight. I mean, right, it's axiomatic. As, uh, but what's interesting is some people can eat a ton and never seem to put on any weight, and other people can't seem to lose weight no matter how much they diet. What we've shown is that you need to go through a tipping point in your ecosystem. And that time frame is about nine months to 18 months, depending upon the individual, whereby you basically eat and diet that's very different to your current diet and reshape that ecosystem inside your gut so that that new ecosystem, the new microbes that will occur after that, make you less susceptible to that diet. So this is a friend of mine who used to weigh a lot, 385 pounds, right? And he lost 113 pounds, so I've got to look at the slide, to, uh, by eating a traditional Chinese whole grain diet, right? Just basically whole grains all day long. Um, this has been shown in many diet studies to be highly effective in treating certain cardiovascular diseases as well as helping to reduce obesity. Um, when, he, when he basically surveyed his microbiome, he looked at the bacteria living in his poop, right? After he lost the weight, compared it to what he looked like before he lost the weight, he found one organism, Clostridium uh, enterobacter cloaceae B29. Now, e. 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 Cloacae B29 is a, a complex organism, but it's just a pro-inflammatory bug. It's living in pretty much every single person in this room. But when it, when it sees the right kind of food environment, it loves high fat and high sugar, it becomes really abundant. And when that happens, it disrupts how our body processes food energy. It disrupts your circadian cycles even. Makes you, uh, your body think it's nighttime when it's actually daytime, right? It confuses how your body deals with the food. And you can see that when you put it into a rat, or a mouse in this case. That's a mouse with Enterobacter cloaceae B29 in it at a high dose. And that's a mouse without it. There's a difference. Can you spot it? <laughs> now, that difference is driven entirely by the bacteria affecting how the body processes food energy. Both those mice are on the same amount of calories, controlled. Both of them are on the same amount of exercise but one of them has a microbe which is disrupting how it deals with food energy. So we need to understand that, right? Imagine if I could bottle up the antithesis of this and put it in a probiotic and sell it in Whole Foods, I would literally have to stop talking for the rest of my life. <laughs> Might be fun. <laughs> but I haven't got there yet. Depression and anxiety. We know that the food you eat can affect how you feel. Um, anyone that's uh, gone on a, an ice cream binge like I have frequently or, or drunk too much, right? That hangover affects how you feel, okay? You might, that might sound like, well, of course. But even when you catch the flu, you feel down, right? You don't feel at peak optimum performance. Seems rational. But what happens inside your intestine is shaping what happens inside your brain. Those feelings of depression, those feelings of anxiety, those feelings of sometimes self-loathing are real. And they're manufactured by how your body is processing energy. we shown in a number of different studies recently that when people change what they eat, it can affect the bacteria living inside their gut, which can change uh, the signals which are sent up to the brain. That subsequently changes the kind of neurotransmitters, the serotonin, for example, that's in the brain, the quantity of it, and that shapes how you feel, right? It alters your behavior and your feelings of anxiety. We see this in the animal study. A lot of our work we do is in animals because, um, for some reason, I'm not allowed to experiment on humans. I, I'm at a loss to describe why. Um, this is a, uh, an elevated plus maze. It's basically a big cross about a meter off the ground Two sides of that box, uh, two sides of the maze are boxes, and the other two sides are open. A normal mouse hangs out inside the box, because if you 
the normal mouse out in the wild didn't hang outside the box, it would get eaten by the predators, right? The, the mouse actually um, spends so much time in there that it hardly ever comes out. But if I take all the microbes away from it, it goes and hangs out outside here. So a mouse without microbes is really brave, right? Not very clever maybe in the wild, but in this environment it hangs out and it has no fear and sometimes it throws itself off the end. Now what we've shown is that we can disrupt the, the difference between those two. Right? To make a, an animal germ-free with no microbes is very difficult. But if I take the mouse and I feed it high fat and high sugar, it basically spends more time out here. Its behavior has been altered to a behavior which, for a mouse, is very dangerous. Okay? We, we want to try and understand what that does to human behavior and how it shapes that behavior. We also know that exposure to the environment in our lives can alter how we, uh, how we change our, um, our health state. So this is an Amish farm in northern Indiana, and we've worked with the Amish and the Hutterite communities. The Hutterites live in North Dakota. They both started in Eastern Europe, the same genetic population. Then one went up to Sweden, the other one went down to Switzerland, and then they both in the 19th century immigrated over to America. They all live um, a technology-free lifestyle at home. I take my kids to this farm to show them that a child can survive without an iPad for 10 minutes. <laughs> but most interestingly, the Amish kids work on the farm, another good work ethic lesson. The Hutterite kids don't, they're not allowed to. The Hutterite community, no technology at home, but the Hutterites have very advanced farming technology, right? So the kids can't go there, health and safety regulations prevent it. So they've had this cessation of exposure to the farming environment. The Amish kids have 4% asthma, the Hutterite kids have 22% asthma. Massive increase. And we've shown that by taking the dust from the Amish homes and exposing it to animals that act like the Hutterite kids, we can actually re re um, basically turn their asthma over, prevent them from having asthma in the first place. So exposure to the right kinds of microbes and then the right diet on top of it can be highly effective in treating disease. You are living in this microbial ecosystem that we call the built environment, right? In a home, uh, um, an auditorium or an office space. Each one of you is emitting 38 million bacterial cells into your immediate vicinity every hour, right? Think pig pen from the Peanuts cartoon, right? <laughs> he may have been the healthiest one by, by all accounts of my research, but you're all becoming more microbially friendly just sitting next to each other. That's because your body doesn't stop at the skin, right? It continues to extend, and it's our job as scientists and researchers to try and figure out what that means for your health. It's only in the last hundred years that as a species we spent all this time living inside our homes and we really want to adjust it and figure out the most effective way to make this environment as healthy as the Amish farm. How do, how, why do so many of our kids get allergies? Why is there a special peanut only table, or peanut, no peanut table at the, at the local elementary school? What, where is all this asthma coming from? Why are some of our kids getting neurodevelopmental conditions? How do we augment the environment to be more effectively healthy? We've um, followed homes over time, and this is a small nugget, but it's, it's a fun one. So this is our light-hearted intersection before I get really deep again. Um, this is, uh, these are four different environments in a home, like a kitchen counter, a bathroom doorknob, a bathroom floor, kitchen floor, etc. Right? The x-axis down here is time, so days of observation. And the y-axis is the number of bacteria found on that surface that came from one of six occupants. You've got six occupants. You've got a young man, 25 years old, living with his mum and dad. You've got his dad, person two, in orange. And then yellow is his mum. Okay? And then you've got three dogs. We don't know their relationship. Um, <laughs> they didn't write it on the form. I, what am I going to do? First thing you can tell about this home from my nefarious FBI regulation database is that the mother spends the vast majority of time in the kitchen. <laughs> it's a horribly gender imbalanced society, right? Um, until she goes away for a very short period of time and the father's microbiome explodes onto the kitchen counter as he desperately fends for himself, taking the peanuts and rubbing them on the bread. Um, and the floors are all dog bacteria, right? Because that's great. You can see that the light switches and doorknobs have dog bacteria, the blue bits, right? Uh, that's great. So uh, the dogs are either very clever or every time you pet your dog, you pick up some microbes and you move it over and you touch the surface. Interestingly, couples that have a dog in their home share more of their own microbes than couples without. So bacterial sharing can be enhanced by having a dog in your home. 
Um, also, more interestingly, couples with a baby share less bacteria than couples with a dog. So if you think microbes are important, then getting a dog might be better for your marriage than getting a baby. <laughs> I, just saying. It's not professional advice, just an opinion. And just finally, I just want to touch on this. Uh, no matter what you do, no matter what you eat, sometimes we have to go in for surgery, and we, we're trying desperately to figure out what effect that has, because some people, when they go in for surgery, get an infection. And we want to minimize the number of infections that occur in our hospitals on a regular basis. So I come into the Department of Surgery at University of Chicago, an ecologist, and ask, well, what the hell can I do in that environment? And we wanted to find out why microbes became pathogens and where they come from in the first place. So this is a, a gut environment, right? Um, let's say I'm going to do a surgery. I'm going to chop out a section of this colon uh, because it's got colonic polyps. could be cancerous. I do two things when I do that. I let oxygen into the gut. Most of the bacteria are anaerobic. They don't like oxygen, right? It, makes, it stresses them out. Then I pump the body full of antibiotics because I'm worried about the microbes. I, I kill off most of them. I only leave a few really tough ones left. And then I stitch the gut back up, forming what we call an anastomotic junction. This is one final thing. The body starts to suck phosphorus out of the gut, causing phosphorus, as you heard before, is, a, is a, an important nutrient. The bacteria need it. When they don't have it, they starve, they panic, they start to search it out, they form a biofilm, a, a swarming motility on the surface, they release something called collagenase, which breaks down your gut lining, and your gastrointestinal contents spill out into your body cavity and you can die from that, it causes severe sepsis. We found that by feeding the bacteria the food they want, we can actually prevent them from becoming virulent and basically stop these kind of infections from happening. Works incredibly well in our animal studies. We started human trials now and are looking towards FDA regulation for these kinds of novel drugs. Prebiotics to help the bacterial community inside your body be more robust when it comes to having a surgical operation. And if we can do that, we can significantly reduce the likelihood of having mortality after a surgery. This can only be good. I do have a book. Um, I have to advertise it uh, because my publishers request it. But uh, I deal with a lot of this <laughs> text in there, right? Uh, probiotics and what they do and why we should eat them, what you should feed your children, what you should feed yourself during pregnancy, the kinds of information that we can only glean from really hardcore, uh, high-quality science and investing it in a book that can actually empower parents. I, myself, as a parent, suffered a number of times from misadvice from doctors as well as everybody else. Um, and so I wanted to really find out what the real information was, what the absolute evidence was. Um, so sometimes it can be uh, exciting, and other times it can be even more exciting. So buy it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, well, fantastic. Let's ask uh, Christina and uh, Joshua to join Jack on the stage here, please. So we'll uh, ask some questions as well. And uh, we'll ask uh, those of you that have questions, this is a really a, a great opportunity to ask all three of these fantastic scientists the uh, question of your choice. Please uh, raise your hand and we'll bring your microphone. So please, questions now. There you go, sir. I'm very curious, I enjoyed the presentation immensely, but I'm very curious about in our current political climate, <laughs> with, well, it, I think it's a, it, we can laugh at it, but it, it has to be dealt with. I live in Morris, Illinois, which is a farming community. And when I go home tonight, if I need a drink and I stop at the bar, and if I told them I was here, and I was taught, uh, you know, being uh, educated by three scientists, anything that would come after that would be just rejected out of hand as you know, uh, discredited. So my question is... Do you want us to come with you, or...? Well, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I could use a I couple could, of I could use a beer. I'll tell you. Or, or the lady could distract them so the rest of us could escape. But, but seriously, 
you know, obviously the crowd here is very educated. We are interested in these things. And I just get very depressed, and maybe it's what I'm eating, but it's, it's, very, <laughs> it, it's very much related to the fact that the scientific community, do you have any plans to communicate more effectively with a general stupid population? Can I, can I take that? <laughs> to take it, I have to take it. I don't I don't, I don't, oh, yeah, hello, hello. <laughs> I might be as stupid as everyone else. I, I, I don't think there is stupid, right? Um, I think there's, there's innocent of information, and I come across a lot of that. It, it's, about, it's about trying to get past people's initial biases. I'm English, in case you didn't notice. So a lot of Americans just think the redcoats are coming and get angry at me. So initially, it's always a little hard to get past that. We work with a lot of communities in South Chicago who are traditionally, uh, obviously African-American, but traditionally quite nervous about talking to scientists about some of the uh, research that we want to do. Uh, for a good reason. A lot of the times they were severely abused in the past by certain medical studies. Um, so, yeah, overcoming that is a really key component. But in terms of just talking to the current political climate, I mean, I go to church groups around Chicago and I work with them. I've been into rural communities and I give talks and I integrate and I try and make them laugh and that can help, right? Yes. Um, but also just being there and being able to talk with them over a pint, mm -hmm. um, which if you're buying, I'm coming, um, <laughs> is... is Absolutely the key, right? And yeah, putting ourselves out there in the community yep. is absolute. This is, I agree, a filtered community. You guys are all amazing, <laughs> right? And you should give yourself a clap on the back for that. But we have to get but Yeah, uh, and, and, and for our work, we actually do work with uh, real farmers. Uh, we are renting land from one farmer. We had several workshops and meetings with them. And, and, and really, everything we are trying to do is really something that if, the, if it passes the laugh test, of the people who are going to be using it, then it's really, we know that we are onto something, right? And so that is really part, and that's what our sponsors also want to us to, to keep that stakeholder community together. Obviously, we cannot do many things, but, uh, but, but that is really a key thing. So just try to make sure that whatever we concoct out in our labs, in our minds, really eventually passes this test with, with people. So. Yeah, I, I grew up um, uh, in and around Lubbock, Texas, mostly working on cotton fields for most of my childhood. So I go back there every once in a while. And I try to talk to people as much as I can, um, largely in bars, because that's the best place to, to actually get someone's attention. Um, and then I go back six months later, and largely they seem to have forgotten everything, all of the things that they were really excited about me saying before. But I just say it again, go through it again, and they get excited again. And I think eventually it sticks. It's, it's all about repetition and... Uh, you know, some things get through, or at least they get through to some people, and people do change, so they just change very, very slowly. Thank you, thank you. Question over here, please. Yeah, I just uh, had a question. Um, what are your thoughts on the um, amount of uh, vaccinations that uh, we give our young kids and its effect on the gut microbes and all the increase in allergies and diseases that we see in our kids today? Hey, I wrote a book called Dirt is Good, right? Uh, if, we, <laughs> if, if your child isn't vaccinated, then dirt is not good. Uh, it could kill your child. Um, so we are very nervous about that. Um, look, vaccinations are extremely important. They've saved literally hundreds of millions of lives. And without them, we would be struggling. We've forgotten what it was like. Polio, for example. You know, you understand how many children that mutilated and killed and how many adults suffered with the consequences. We had a president in the White House who was in a wheelchair because of polio, right? These are, these are things that used to affect and kill millions and millions of people. Uh, TB is one of them, right? 50 million people a year died in the US and Europe alone in the 19th century because of TB. Now, now that doesn't exist, right? We've essentially eradicated it until you go into places where vaccinations or poor healthcare choices mean that that starts to spread. We, we, need, we need these things. I agree, in the past there were concerns. <laughs> But I, I've personally done clinical trials to examine how that affects autism. I have an autistic son. And I've never found an association in any of the studies that are linked to it. So I was perfectly happy to vaccinate my kids because of that. Good news. Question here in the middle, please. I have a... 
Right in the middle, please. I have a related question to the, the first question. The, the information to generate in the farmlands in terms of practical things that could be done to improve productivity was really great research. My question has to do with how do you take something like that and scale it up into something that's actually, actually meaningful when you have a, a coming crisis situation where 2050 is not all that far away, and somehow you have to get that information out to the farmers that actually can use it or the, the people that implement that stuff. So I'll, I'll just say one thing. Um, what needs to be done there? I mean, so there's two different questions in, in that, right? One is really technical. How do you scale? How do you understand what you do at small scale and, and, and how you scale it back up? Um, that is really a question of, of really, um, in my mind, to understand even more uh, at, at certain spatial scales what our data can tell us, right? And so the big impact on precision agriculture and all that is really exactly that, that, that having uh, opportunities to do cheaply a lot of data collection and with the new computing resources that we have, hopefully we can crack that nut um, you know, for, for once. We have had tremendous investments in, in trying to understand how watersheds work, right? And how we can improve the, the, the water quality in a watershed. And, and, and the response was oftentimes very noncommittal because we didn't have enough power of data, right? Now we are at the point in, 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 in society where we can have that. And so that will really encourage a lot of this expansion in scale. Uh, as far as implementation and all that, uh, the key is really to find a system that only works for the environment, but works also for farmers' pockets, right? And, and, and something that people recognize as doable and to their benefit. And, and, and that's why I'm saying if we have a benefit, we ask farmers, for example, to do things not only to make a, create a crop, but to create water quality, then we got to account for it somewhere in the economic kind of envelope of, of what we do, right? We need to have that system in place so that we actually recognize something. Nobody produces something for nothing, right? We need to, to make that step. And how we do it is a really good scientific challenge that we want to do. There's a lot of things we need to know how to do it, but that's the direction that I think should be taken. And, and what you find is, while it sounds insurmountable, insurmountably hard to convince every farmer to take on some better practice that they may or may not be skeptical of, there are always the you know cutting edge people, just like there are in, in, in any field, you know, just like there are in technology adapt uh, adoption, who are willing to try out something new, who are willing to push the boundary. Mm -hmm. And once the farmers around them see how much they're succeeding, seeing that they're making more money, um, and and and, do, and and actually improving even the environments around uh, around their farms, then that that it starts to take up and it starts to adopt more. And then you also have. You know the organizations, the the, the farm service providers, mm -hmm. um, the 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 co-ops, the the extension agents. That once you can convince those organizations to really start pushing these things and educating local farmers, these things can really take off quickly. I mean, like anything, a adoption is a, a huge challenge, and it's it's not instantaneous. It's not a step function. Adoption takes takes time. But once um, once it starts to take off, I mean, it can really uh, revolutionize an area. And you can see in lots of different examples like. Um, new irrigation application technologies in Kansas and new soil management. Once they started to run out of water, people started saying, oh, we can do X, Y, and Z to conserve the water that we have. And within a decade, basically everybody in Kansas was using you know, low flow, drop, drop nozzle sprinklers and was doing ground cover to conserve as much soil moisture as they could. These practices, once they're, to, once they're shown to be profitable, can, will take off like wildfire. Very good, very good. Question down here, please. Yeah, I, I have a, a question which is more towards Dr. Elliott, and uh, you said how important the gut uh, bacteria are. So what do you think of uh, probiotics? I mean, do you think we should all be on them, or? Uh, well, no, okay, so most probiotics you buy in the, in the supermarket, so you go down to Whole Foods and you look at the shelf, there's lots of them, right? And they all say they improve your health. We actually have very little evidence that they do. Uh, there are, however, many probiotic strains, those bacterial species, that have gone through double-blind, placebo-controlled clinical trials for the treatment of certain conditions. So if your child has diarrhea, I strongly suggest you go out and grab some Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, which you can what, buy in a store. The ones that are refrigerated. Some of them, are, that yeah. one is refrigerated, yeah. Uh, there's also another one, uh, it, that's been proven to be highly effective in reducing the amount of time you'll suffer from the diarrhea, the child will. Um, there's another one, E. coli nissel. You actually can't buy that in this country uh, because of regulation reasons, but it's sold in every other country on Earth as Mutiflor. <laughs> um, 
And it's highly effective in treating salmonella infections. So instead of taking an antibiotic for salmonella, which can actually cause more disruption, often the salmonella is resistant, taking Mutaflor has been shown to eradicate the infection in two days. And it's because it outcompetes the salmonella, right? It's highly effective at doing this. And there are many other examples of that. But these are clinical applications. They're saying, you've got a disease, take this. If you want to stay healthy and maintain your health, instead of going out and spending an awful lot of money on a probiotic, I strongly suggest you just eat healthier and do more exercise, which is hard, I know, right? <laughs> uh, trust me, I know. Uh, those hamburgers are very nice in this country. Um, not so much in England, strangely. But um, the, it's hard, right? But that's, that's the best recommendation. My mother says constantly, that's your best recommendation? I've been telling you that since you were born. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But now I have proof, mum. Um, but that's an important, it's an important strategy. I, I'll take a probiotic occasionally um, if I'm suffering from gastrointestinal inflammation, which is a condition I occasionally suffer from. Uh, the one I take is VSL3 because it has clinical evidence to support treatment of that disease. Question over this way, please. Oh, oh over here, I'm sorry. Oh, a young man, okay. The, the pesticides that are in a plant, uh, plants in our crops, are those increasing or decreasing the bacteria? That's a good question. Good question. Yeah. We, we, we actually don't know. We do know that um, when you add pesticides or herbicides, the things that kill the weeds, right, to the crops, um, that it does actually affect how the plant grows and how it interacts with its environment. We, we think that there's a, there's a form, I, I only know this about from wine production, which you'll find out about wine later. And you'll, <laughs> it'll be good, right? But uh, in wine production, there's a form of wine production called biodynamique, where they take biological activity and they produce everything without the use of chemicals, right? Well, water's a chemical, so <laughs> dihydrogen oxide, it's a very dangerous corrosive substance. Um, but without the use of fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides in chemical form. And those um, show actually a more diverse bacterial population in the soil and in the plant than the ones that use the chemical fertilizers and the herbicides and pesticides. Now, we don't necessarily understand why, but we do think that the greater the diversity, the more robust the crop is against disease, for example. And there's a lot of research going into trying to understand that better. Thank you. Who's next over here? Uh, yeah, I have uh, perhaps a two-part question. Uh, one is, has is this the whole mi microbial field of strategic effects on us have anything to do with such things as helping solve the mystery of how to cure like diabetes or cancer or other very, you know. Yes, yeah, so with cancer, for example, one of the premium cancer therapies at the moment is something called um, immune blockade therapy, where we take a, um, a drug which actually activates our immune system to fight the cancer. So it helps, you, it helps your immune system see the cancer again. What we found is that when we add a probiotic, in this case something called bifidobacterium, into the person's body as an oral supplement while they're taking the immune blockade therapy, it supercharges the immune system and allows their body to really get down deep and start to reduce the tumor volume. So that's proven to be highly effective and there are now, I think uh, about uh, $200 million has been invested in that in a company that's starting to commercialize that with FDA approval or application, uh, but there are clinical trials ongoing now to determine if we can uh, really see an effect in a much larger population. Um, and for IBD, absolutely, there's, a, there's three companies on the market now which are generating uh, clinical grade probiotic formulations of say, 20, 25 different bacteria that actually help to reduce the inflammation in the colon and treat uh, colitis in, in the exact environment in which you are dealing with it. And a couple which are producing chemicals uh, chemical drugs which are based on microbial products which appear to be related to reduce inflammation. Two of those are being, have come out of University of Chicago and Argon based co collaborations. So. And, and the related question is the, the world of soils and plants have their own microbial 
communication system that works very effectively. Is there any research that has tended to or attempted to try and find the synergy between that system and the microbial system in our bodies? That's a, that's a big question. Uh, yes, um, but it's, it's tenuous, right? The, we know that um, uh, plants, uh, leafy, leafy greens, for example, appear to have an improvement in our health based on uh, probiotic stimulation. And we've never been able to figure out why. We think it's bacteria living inside the leaves, so-called endophytes. These are bacteria that live actually inside the plant. If you have a greater diversity of those inside the leafy green, it can actually help stimulate the immune system during consumption. But those are very, very early phase clinical studies, and there's a lot of uncertainty there. But yeah, um, like the, the, the kid who went off to get some wine from the bar, um, <laughs> saying healthy soil, healthy plant, potentially healthy people, right? Um, a lot of work to be done there, though, because right. we've still got to feed an ever-growing population of people. So. We'll see. Question over here. Who's got the microphone? Here in the middle. Yeah, a, oh, sorry. Uh, a comment and a, and a question. Uh, the comment is, is, wouldn't tonight's presentation make an awesome TED Talk? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Thank you. Thank you. And secondly, I saw something unusual in my backyard here in the last couple of days. I actually saw a bee. And I noticed in the slides that there was a reference to pollinators. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know that we've got a real problem going on right now with white nose uh, disease in bats and, of course, colony collapse disorder with bees. Could you speak to possibly a, either a microbial link to that or a pesticide link and what's being done and where, where does that stand right now? So they've been doing a lot of work uh, in that, and I don't know that they already have a, a Definitive answer is probably accumulation of different effects, but one of the of the um, uh, of the hypotheses they have for um, bee colony collapse is really a combination of um, pesticides, which increase mortality and weaken the, the populations, and at that point, oh, microbial communities go in, and, and there is an imbalance there that actually kills them off with with some kind of um, I believe it's a fungal infection, in fact, uh, and other bacteria also uh, that you know like everywhere, like in a, in, a, in a regular plant or so, if you start having any humans, if you weaken the, 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 the organism, then you make it a lot more susceptible to, uh, to pathogenic impacts. Can I make one further yeah. addition to that? Because yeah. it's a really cool study that we've done but we haven't published. Uh -huh. uh, if we give bees antibiotics, we treat bees in mm -hmm. commercial products, things right. with antibiotics to stop them from dying, like you said, right? right? You give bees antibiotics, it prevents them from doing the waggle dance. <laughs> the thing that tells the, uh, the other bees where the pollen is. And so they get lost and confused, right? Mm -hmm. And so you see an almost 60% reduction in waggle dance activity in hives which are being um, regularly, uh, um, I guess, uh, what's the word when you give something pro proactively? Proactively antibioticized. Mm -hmm. It's a new word I invented. There we are. <laughs> Very good. We're going to have one last uh, formal question, and then I'm sure Jack and Christina and Joshua will be here for a while after the formal session. So please. Yes. Um, what about the effect of genetically modified food and crops, and that the, the effects of those genetic modifications on our microbiome and our genetic makeup? Um, to the very best of my knowledge, we've seen no evidence at all that genetically modified food stuff can affect the genetics of the microbiome. It, it, it wouldn't necessarily work, right? Those are plant genes, insect genes, fish genes, whatever, but they're, they're animal plant genes, they're not bacterial genes. So they, they can't, they don't really transfer between those two kingdoms. Bacteria are very different genetically to animals and plants. Um, I, I, I do know that uh, uh, genetically modified crops appear to be just as nutritious, so I can't see that it would affect even the microbial productivity in the gut, I, but I haven't seen a lot of data to support either conclusion. Thank you. Very good. Well, thank, thank you, uh, really. Thank you all. Thank you.